Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, our next, our next speaker is John Yard, and John's going to tell us about exact synthesis of single qubit unitaries. All right, thanks, Krista. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so I'm excited to talk to you guys about some research that I've been doing um, for at least the last year since coming up here to, uh, to the main campus of MSR, um, collaborating a lot with, uh, with Vadim Klishnikov on uh, some questions in quantum circuit synthesis. So I'll mainly be talking about <clears throat> uh, some documentation of our research, which is in uh, on the archive here. And the paper is called uh, A Framework for Exact Synthesis, but maybe a, uh, <clears throat> a more descriptive title would have been, you know, uh, Exact Synthesis of, cu of uh, Qubit Unitaries Using uh, Quaternion Algebra Arithmetic. So, so what's the deal with... Uh, so what do we mean by exact synthesis, or more generally, just synthesis of quantum circuits? So if you're going to try to build a quantum computer, you'll have some device that maybe has some limited number of gates that it can do, some finite set. And that's not really going to be sufficient to do an arbitrary computation. So you're going to hope that this finite set can get you arbitrarily close to any unitary that you might want to do. And, um, and then you want to get to it as fast as possible so that you can use as, as, as few computational resources as, uh, as, as needed in order, to, uh, in order to run your computation. So <clears throat> there's a classic theorem, Solovey-Kataev, which says that if I have some gate set, and let's say it's in SU2, but really I can take any constant size. And it, it says that if I then have some arbitrary unitary in SU2 that I would like to achieve, but if I only have, so if this gate set just contains some, you know, U1, US for some finite set, then I can find some sequence of U's. So for any epsilon, that there exists some sequence of length, order, poly, log 1 over epsilon, such that if I compute, let's say, the operator norm between u and u1, let's say u s1, u s n, that I can get this less than epsilon for n like that. So this tells us that we can efficiently approximate any unitary in SU2 with a finite set. But when you actually do the gate counts, and people did, you get some sort of depressing numbers. But, um, <clears throat> but it turns out that one can do better in certain cases. So <clears throat> there's a paper from, uh, let's see, 86, uh, Lubotsky, Phillips, Sarnak. And uh, it has some kind of a scary title about HECA operators on SU2. But what they do is they construct explicit expanding gra expander graphs, essentially from finding they have a very nice gate set, essentially, that, that rapidly fills the space of all unitaries. It actually grows kind of exponentially fast. And then so they can get rid of this polylog. So I should mention that the, you know, for, for general gate sets, Solovey-Kataev gives you about, about the fourth degree here in this polynomial. But you can just get rid of the polynomial for certain gate sets. So, so what is the gate set that these guys found? So it comes from quaternion arithmetic. OK, so, um, so what are quaternions? Okay. <clears throat> quaternions are, let's say, a, a, you can think of them as like a generalization of the complex numbers. But more explicitly, you can think of them as some vector space over the real numbers with a non-trivial multiplication defined on it. So, so we have kind of four vectors, one, and i, j, and k. And these satisfy some relations. So i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals minus one. 
This formula was famously chiseled onto a bridge by Hamilton when he discovered the quaternions in the 1800s. Um, and so, so, so what's so special um, about the quaternions? Well, um, oh, I should add one more, ij equals k. And we all work with quaternions all the time without quite realizing it in the sense that there's, that we can view the quaternions as some subalgebra of the two by two matrices, but not a complex subalgebra, but a real subalgebra. So it's some real vector space living inside here. And essentially, the mapping goes like the real numbers go to the identity matrix. And then I take i to square root of one sigma x j, which is square root of minus one sigma y and k. Sigma z. So these guys here we call the pure, uh, the pure quaternions. And in this setting, they, they map to the space of anti Hermitian two by two complex matrices. And this kind of scalar part is just you know, scalar real multiples of the identity. So <clears throat> one of the nice things about quaternions, maybe the nice thing about them mathematically, is that they let you construct spin representations, double covers. So Namely, we have a map. So let me call, I'll give a name for this, H for the Hamilton quaternions. And so there's a map, the spin covering map, which takes you from, so this little x here means it's the elements of the quaternions that are invertible. And actually, it turns out that every non-zero quaternion is invertible. So this is a, a non-trivial example of what's called a division algebra or a division ring in, in mathematics. So, Everything that's not zero has an inverse. And we go from these guys to SO3 over the reals. And there's an explicit way to do this. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. So what we do is we take this space here of pure quaternions. We view that as R3. And we act on this space with quaternions. So namely, given some quaternion in here, we take it to the map that takes a pure quaternion to Q, X, Q inverse. So it conjugates by a quaternion, OK? And so namely, this X here would be of the form X1, I plus X2, J plus X3, K. And, um, and it turns out we get a two to one mapping. Uh, well, I should say a many to one mapping. So here we have actually the real numbers are kind of the kernel of this map, right? So scalars do nothing because they kind of commute through. But the fact that these are a non commutative algebra is exactly what allows us to get this covering. So, so, so why go through all this effort? So, what we can do is we can fix the notion of integers inside the quaternions and you get something called the Lipschitz. And what these are, these are just you put integers in place of the real numbers. Okay? So we didn't do anything fancy there. But it turns out that inside this ring, so now we can kind of do arithmetic in here. And we can also find some interesting gate sets. So namely the ones that these guys analyzed was, let's say, let me call this map something. I'm going to call this R. So it, R for rotation. And so they gave these gates, R of uh, 1 plus 2i, say plus or minus 2j, R of 1 plus or minus 2k. So here's six gates. This is your gate set. So this is <clears throat> And it turns out that this is, these are essentially in a certain sense, this is the best gate set that you might hope for, in the sense that it fills SU2 as rapidly as possible. I won't get into the details of how one shows that. Um, but this gate set was uh, identified as a gate set for quantum computing, um, I think in like 2006, as a paper by Harrow, uh, Recht, and Chang. And they, uh, they, they noticed that, well, okay, so one thing I didn't mention about this Solovey Kataev is that not only do you get a sequence that grows like order log 1 over epsilon, but you can find it 
in time, or sorry, polylog 1 over epsilon, but you can find it in time that grows like polylog 1 over epsilon. So here now we have these sequences of gates that give you just order log 1 over epsilon scaling. But this was just an existence proof. It wasn't known at the time how to actually compile into such a gate set or how to find the best one of this form you know, that can be generated by these that approximates a given gate set so, or given a gate that you want. So this problem was recently solved in this group in the last year or two by uh, a nice paper by, uh, um, by Krista and Yuri and Alex. And they showed how to solve not only the exact synthesis problem in the sense of given some target you know, rotation that you'd like to do, that you know is possible to do exactly, find the shortest circuit. But they could also say, given you know, an epsilon, find like, the nearest or essentially the optimal, like, you know, next to nearest um, unitary. That's, so if you have some u that you want to do, you have some epsilon ball, measure an appropriate norm, and when, you know, find the nearest guy that, is, um, that can be done with some fixed number n. Okay. Because you know you've abstracted it for the quaternions. Sure. But your basic building blocks are the powders. Right. So can you say what that is? Um, so I can describe it more easily, I think, just in terms of orthogonal rotations, because I worked it out in the last hour. Okay. But um, what they wound up being actually is so like one of these guys, and I may get it wrong, but it'd be something like three fifths. Not right. Yeah, we can. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can do this mapping here that I said. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And maybe I should mention another thing. So there's a nice formula. So there's a notion of, a, uh, of the conjugate of a quaternion. So Q bar would be like uh, Q0 minus Q1i minus Q2j minus Q3k if Q was the same thing with pluses. And then this can actually be rewritten as Qx Q bar divided by Q, Q bar. So you can sort of think of this as being able to work with unnormalized unitaries, that you can you know, pull the unitary off here. So this, is, this winds up being literally conjugate transpose, this bar operation, right? because it, it inverts the, uh, um, the anti-Hermitian ones, but leaves the Hermitian one alone. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so, so this was sort of, uh, this was worked out in that paper. But there are other gate sets that people consider besides this one. This is kind of artificial, and I, I believe that there's some known ways to distill. Um, they, they call this the V basis for reasons that I'm not quite sure why. Um, oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. So it's the V basis. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so a much more popular gate set is what we know in uh, quantum information theory as Clifford plus T. So Clifford plus T was sort of lacking a quaternionic interpretation up until our work. So I want to explain how that, how that enters the picture. So But before I get there, I'll tell you a little bit more about Lipschitz quaternions. So let me call this L for Lipschitz. And so given any ring, if we write a little times up here, what this means in math is this is called the unit group of the ring. So you know, rings, are, rings are closed under addition and multiplication, but they don't necessarily contain inverses. So this is all the invertible guys in your ring. So what's the unit group of the Lipschitz quaternion order? It actually winds up being what's known in math as the quaternion group. Okay, so this has eight elements 
plus or minus 1, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k. So in quantum information, we often talk about the, the, uh, the Pauli group, which is very closely related, which is essentially what you get if you tensor this with the square root of minus 1, or if you allow putting in the square root of minus 1. So in other words, just you know, plus or minus i times sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, or the identity. But I would argue that we really should be thinking more about quaternions than Pauli's, because in some sense, the arithmetic comes out a little cleaner. And I'll, I'll try to say a little more about what I mean by that. So there's a notion of, so being an integer is something that, that has a very concrete mathematical definition that I'm not really going to try to get across you today. But what I'll say is that there are bigger rings of integers inside the quaternions that contain this. So it, it's a sort of, this is a non-maximal order in mathematical speak. And it's contained in a maximal order called the Hurwitz quaternions, which look almost the same. But they look like this. So, so these guys kind of live inside here as some finite index subring. Okay? But why do we do something like this? Well, now if we ask for the unit group of this order, it's slightly bigger. And actually, it winds up being isomorphic to Q8 semi-direct product with an order of three element. So all this means is that I have a group that contains the quaternions, or this quaternion group, along with some other order three guy that permutes them. And maybe now is when it's good to draw a picture. So if you imagine acting with single qubit gates on the block sphere, what you wind up doing is you permute the corners of this cube. It's, you know, so the qubit Clifford group, if you will, is actually in math known as the uh, <clears throat> as the um, well, the octahedral group, but it's also the symmetries of the square. And the octahedron is kind of the dual polytope to the or sorry to the cube. Um, <clears throat> and so what the quaternion group is doing is it's just rotating the cube by you know by a pi rotation about the x, y, or the z axis. But now we allow this other order three guy right in here. And this is, you could write down what this gate is, and I forget where it is. Um, but it's not hard to construct it. So this group here is actually known as the binary, or just the tetrahedral. Just a word about binary versus ordinary tetrahedral. So the tetrahedral group is actually, so this is binary. So this would be as an element of SO3 of R, but binary is a double cover. So that's an SU2 of C. So, so you need to be a little careful in certain instances which one you're talking about, but for the purpose of this talk, don't worry about it. So we almost have the Clifford group, but we only kind of have this, this, uh, this subgroup. Because the Clifford group has, if we look at it as a subgroup of SO3, it has 24 elements. But here we only have 12. Okay, so, so, so we're missing some. Well, this is 24, but it's a double cover, so divide by 2, and you get 12. So where's the rest of them? Where's the rest of the Clifford group? Where's T? How do you fit it in here? And so to do this, we need to do a little more work. And we need to generalize further what we mean by an integer. So you know, Z, the ordinary integers, you know, these live inside well, the real numbers, but they also live inside, you know, intermediately, the, the, uh, the rational numbers. Okay, and so the rationals and the reals, these are fields. Okay, so these are things where you can add, multiply, and, um, <clears throat> and you can also divide by any, any non-zero element, similar to the quaternions, but now things commute. Okay? So it turns out that it's, it's very useful to work not at the level of the continuum, but at kind of this you know, discrete type of a field and to generalize to Q adjoin the square root of some, or, or some other algebraic number. And for this talk, we probably won't get much beyond adjoining the square root of 2. Okay? And there's a notion of integers inside this, this field. It's, it's an example of a number field. Let me write it like this. And so, so what this is, I'll just write up here again, z root 2. This is the set of all A 
class B root 2, where A and B are in the integers. Okay, and similarly, Q root 2 is the same thing with being inside the rationals. Okay? <clears throat> and so we can further generalize our notion of quaternions away from allowing just, just real elements like we had for the Hamilton quaternions, but we can restrict it to a subring, which now just has elements with rational coefficients in front of 1, i, j, and k. Or we can kind of pick these guys. So, so you, can, you can really think of this as living inside the reals in this, and, and you should for this talk at least. Um, so, so we can kind of define a new quaternions, which I might just call h of root 2. And um, you know, this is defined as before. But the really interesting thing is that we have this notion of, of, of integral quaternions in here, which I'll write as script O. And they have a slightly different form. So you should sort of think of this as some, as some, dis, as some discrete lattice that lives in eight dimensions now, right? Because each one of these guys lives in two dimensions. It lives in R2, or really in two copies of Q, so in Q2. And so now we have kind of this eight-dimensional discrete lattice that lives in this kind of higher dimensional generalization of the quaternions. And you can ask, well, what is it, its unit group and whatnot? So, the unit group winds up being infinite, but what we have is, if we, so if we go to this covering map here, and if we then, put the integers in like this, and we have our, in this case, it winds up being SO3 over Q root two that we get now some finite subgroup of here, which is exactly of order 24 equals Clifford. And um, <clears throat> just, just to give you, uh, I can list some of them out. So I mean, this right here, and this right here, and these guys, these are all elements that live inside this unit group. And again, you should think of them as being defined up to, up to scalars. Right, because of this covering map that, that ignores the scalar component. And so it turns out we get the whole Clifford group in this way. But that's really not enough, right? Because we're after something that's going to be dense. And we know the Clifford group is finite. So how do we get a dense subgroup? Well, we need a T gate. So where's this Clifford plus T coming from? And so, so the answer is this. So I'll just write it up here. T is uh, 1 plus root 2 plus K. And so if you plug this guy into this map here, actually what you wind up getting, I think, is it, it looks like this. It's like 1 over root 2. And actually, it turns out that the entire image of Clifford plus t is actually going to be contained in SO, it's going to be not contained in, but equal SO3 of this. So you hit the whole thing. And now having such a characterization of all the things that are exactly synthesizable is precisely what you need in order to then take a step back and do the general approximate synthesis problem. Because now we know what the target gates are that we want to try to hit. So you're sort of reduced to doing some maybe complicated algebraic optimizations over this algebraic group, essentially. Um, and, um, and, then, and then you have a hope of solving the problem in general. So in the last few minutes, I kind of want to tell, show you some other examples of, kind of, 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 of how this kind of picture can be generalized in, a, in sort of a huge way. I mean, this is sort of just the tip of an iceberg, really where, in a sense, just about every possible gate set anybody's ever considered K 
can be explained in this type of a framework. And um, one can even go beyond qubits to qtrits, and there's, there's much mathematical machinery that exists to do that. And we're actually having a really fun time learning this stuff with some actual applications in mind. Because I think that the people who developed this stuff did it from, you know, from a very high perspective of it being just pure mathematics without many applications outside of perhaps cryptography. Um, <clears throat> so one example would be Clifford plus T plus V, I'll just say. So this V basis can fit into this framework in, in, in the same way. So basically these V gates just have the same image or the same description via this covering map. Um, <clears throat> but let me, since it's nearly lunchtime, and I guess I started a little late, um, I just want to say a bit more. So, well, I'll say, I'll say a few things. So, so first of all, it, it's sort of helpful to focus on SO3 in a setting, which this is also isomorphic to the projective unitary group, okay, where we ignore phases. And I know like in a lot of the literature, people do things with unitaries, and there's some overall phase that we don't care about. And, um, but when you're really doing the arithmetic, these phases can be a messy thing, as anybody who's kind of gotten deep into this knows. And so it's helpful in some sense to view things in terms of SO3, but it's also helpful to view things in terms of unitaries, especially when we go to higher dimensions, that we can't kind of fall back on this group theoretic accident. And this is some kind of ongoing work on our part in trying to understand things that are known by some people, but not by us as well as we would like. Um, <clears throat> but just to go back, so, so I mentioned this here. So there was a characterization of the exactly synthesizable circuits or unitaries over Clifford plus T that was found by, uh, by Klitschnikov, uh, Maslov, and Mosca. And actually, they gave it in terms of SU2, sorry, U2, over this ring. So this is the ring generated by the eighth roots of unity. This is eta eight is sort of shorthand for e to the two pi i over eight. And by all powers of a half. So you're allowed to divide by two. And this is also kind of a natural notion of integers um, in, a, in a certain well-defined sense. And so it can be sort of difficult to make this work for, some, for certain reasons in um, in other types of theories. And maybe I'll just mention yet another kind of very, very different looking gate set that we hope will be available naturally in systems with topological order. So <clears throat> one other way to make a qubit is if you have some particles, some anions that are, say, confined to two dimensions, and your elementary gates are essentially moving these guys around. So you know, swapping gate, these guys like this. But if we make time go like this, what it actually looks like is something like this. So it's a braid. And as you move around, your circuits are things that look like this. And the idea is that there's some group at play here it's called the braid group. It has two, so in this case, B3 meaning the braid group on three strands, it has, it has two generators, say sigma one and sigma two, is what they call them. And this would be like a, a, a twist of the first two strands, say, let's say, let's say clockwise, is sigma one, and a twist, a clockwise twist of the second two strands would be sigma two. So I think here everything's clockwise, yeah, sigma two. So as an element of the braid group, this braid would be sigma two squared sigma 1, okay? But now what we have, so this is some infinite group, okay? But there's, we have a, an, a representation of this group in, let's say, U2, or in SU2. <clears throat> and it turns out that one can act, so, so I should say that, um, that, that there was, so, um, so Vadim and Krista and Alex, and was there anybody else on your paper? So they, can they solved the approximate synthesis problem for braiding of Fibonacci anions about a, a, a year or two ago um, in the sense that they characterized a set of exactly synthesizable unitaries and 
you know, and, and also solve the approximate synthesis problem in, in a sufficiently nice way. And um, so one thing that kind of came out of you know, another aspect of this work that we, we describe here is, um, is a way to, to give some, some orders in other quaternion algebras that are a little, a little different than these ones, who, that also naturally give rise to these Bray group representations and allow one to, in principle, characterize the images or not in principle, but allow one to characterize the images in terms of essentially algebraic group theory. But what is, <clears throat> what's the order? So maybe I'll just leave you with this. Um, so what we have is an order over, or the quaternion algebra base is Q adjoined to square root of five, okay? And the order looks like this. It's Z, the golden ratio, Times uh, so we get this order for the Fibonacci. And there's some kind of new features that happen here that didn't happen before. So um, I didn't really get into exactly how the quaternion arithmetic is used to do the exact synthesis, but maybe I'll just say a word on that. So, so essentially, we reduce the problem to, so given an exactly synthesizable unitary, you realize it, or you represent it as an integral quaternion by, by scaling. So you can change the scale and put it into this integral ring, right, because it doesn't care about, this map doesn't care about the overall scale. And then, from that unitary, so if it was the V basis case, you can kind of just do trial, trial division. You try dividing by any one of the six gates, and there will only be one that takes it down. In the, the, there's a complexity measure, so I didn't mention this, but there's, there's something called the norm map of a quaternion, and it's just Q, Q bar. And actually what this is, is it's just the Euclidean length of, of, the, uh, of the quaternion that you're working with. And it turns out that the that the norm is going to be something like 5 to the k, where k is the number of v basis unitaries that it takes to do your, to do your circuit in the v basis case. So in the, in the Clifford plus t case, we now get essentially the t count comes up. Because now you get that the norm of some quaternion that you want to synthesize is something like, like root 2 raised to the k, or maybe it's 2. Um, <clears throat> and so this gives you, you can kind of read your t-count off. And what you do is you can kind of just try dividing by the different conjugates of t by the Clifford group and see until you get down, until, until you get down to something with norm 1. And it turns out that the norm 1 guys are the ones that live inside the unit group. And then so, and then you're done, basically. But something very different happens over here, which is that now the unit group is infinite. And actually all the actions in the unit group. So essentially, the whole image of this Bray group representation is contained in the unit group. Really, it's an index uh, two subgroup. So it's all the braids that you can get with an even number of, uh, of, of twists. And so different methods are needed to do the, uh, the exact synthesis. And uh, so one can put to work methods from hyperbolic geometry. And uh, at least in the case of Fibonacci and other certain um, related Bray group types of problems that come from sort of well-known uh, topological field theories called SU2 level K <coughs> churn simons theory. <coughs> and actually, the arithmetic groups that arise are things that are kind of well-known and have been studied since the early days of mathematics that are called arithmetic triangle groups. And there are, I should say that these are the groups that show up in the cases where we know that we can do it with a, with a given algorithm. But for, and these correspond to certain fixed values of k that I won't get into now. More generally, some sort of higher dimensional methods from uh, Shimura varieties are probably needed. So it's probably time for lunch, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Great, thanks, John. 
Uh, other questions for John? So besides the, the uh, let's say the efficiency of the, of the discovery of, of sequences of gates that, that materialize things, there's also the question of how many does it take to approximate something. And it looks like the less abelian and let's say the less congruence relations in the algebraic structure you're dealing with the more like an expander, the graph uh, the reachable unitaries in K steps uh, looks. And I think that's maybe, uh, I mean, I would guess that maybe is why Quinternian based uh, things are, are more efficient than merely adding, adding, uh, adding algebraic stuff to the integers. Um, any comment? Um, well, I think it's all because it's algebraic. Actually, so, so, so there's, a, there's a result of uh, uh, Borgain and Gambard from, the, they have a few papers, one from maybe 2007, one from 2011, and they showed that any gate set with algebra, whose entries are algebraic numbers actually gives you this exponential expansion. And at least in principle, the, you know, there exist you know, uh, log one over epsilon approximating sequences, but they don't know how to find them in general. Is that a problem or is that a, well, a feature? Well, it's a question of how fast you go, uh, you know, depending, on what you're, de depending on what you're adding that root to. What's the oh, algebraic sure. structure you're adjoining it to? So, so I'll add that there, That's all. There, it's the only observation I was trying to make. There, there, are fair, there are various deep mathematical questions, some of which are open, that have to do with the actual, exp the rate at which, you know, optimizing the rate, yes. And, um, and I'm still not quite an expert, but I, I know that even Peter Sarnak, I saw a talk recently about him, and he, he pointed out that in some setting that they could prove something was optimal, but in another setting they couldn't. So I think that even the experts don't quite know. Any other questions? Okay, otherwise let's thank John one more time. And each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.